Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started a little bit early uh, so that the speaker or possibly speakers have full time. I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and um, we're very pleased to be back at the Students for Liberty Conference. We've been participating with y'all for two years, and uh, this is our third year, and we've put together this conference within a conference. It focuses on the importance of civil liberties in the national security state. We just believe that the warfare state it constitutes the greatest threat to the freedom and well-being of the American people. And so we wanted to come to this conference and raise the vision of the students and everybody else to this higher level of, of the critical importance of civil liberties to a free society and what the national security state is doing to infringe on, on those liberties and actually end up destroying them. Uh, we've had a lot of changes in the schedule, as you know. Um, because of all the flight cancellations yesterday, we've had to do a lot of adjusting. And we shifted um, Bob Higgs upward to the previous hour. So if you're here for Bob Higgs' talk, uh, you missed it, but we recorded it. It'll be on our website soon. And uh, we shifted Scott Horton and, and John Glazer down to the last segment. Uh, Scott just landed. He was one of the ones that got his flight canceled. And so I doubt he's going to be here in time, but it's always possible that he may roll in and we'll, we'll let him um, give his talk. But we're going to go on with John Glazer, and if Scott doesn't go on, John's going to handle the, the entire segment. Uh, John's one of the, we wanted John to come and talk at this conference because he's obviously one that's very close to you guys in age, you know, the students. He's 26 years old, and, and he's like a model of what, can be achieved in this movement at a very young age and, and what's possible. They, you know, these people say, oh yeah, when you reach your 30s or 40s you can start writing and speaking. Nonsense. You can, uh, you can be whatever you resolve to be at any age. And uh, John was a former editor at AnnieWar.com, which is the premier website for uh, anti-war stuff. And um, he, after that he, he uh, just started writing articles independently. And he's one of the greatest writers in the movement. I mean, every day we're looking for John's articles. He gets published in the Washington Times, the Huffington Post, um, American Conservative, uh, Daily Caller. Um, it's just awesome. And whenever he has an article out, it, it's like 100% sure that we're going to link to it in our FFF Daily. It's that good. And it's almost always around foreign policy, uh, civil liberties, a national security state, and he, and he writes in such a clear and succinct and easy way that it's the type of thing where you can forward to your friends and your family and they will easily understand it. And not very many people have that capability. A lot of the academics, as you know, uh, write at a level that, you know, just boring, uh, hard to understand. That doesn't apply to John. Uh, he previously also worked at American Conservative. Uh, he, he didn't get published there. He worked there, or I guess he got published there too. Uh, the Cato Institute, the Institute for Humane Studies. So he's got a long pedigree in the movement. Please welcome John Glazer. Well, I appreciate the kind introduction. I was telling, I see some of the crowd has dissipated from the last session. I was telling Jacob, I, I w once read about a, a, pub, a policy, a, sorry, a poll, public poll, which found that huge percentages of Americans have as their greatest fear public speaking as opposed to death. And I, I think that if the stipulation was made that those public speakers would have to follow Bob Higgs, um, even more percentages would oppose it. Uh, anyone coming after Robert Higgs feels like a statist. But um, his, his talk kind of bleeds into mine and what FFF is doing here, I think, um, is a perfect example of, of where I hope the movement will go. Um, just by, by way of personal anecdote, I'm from uh, the Boston area, and prior to coming to DC, I, I never really met other libertarians. I met them in books, and I interacted a little bit on the internet with them, but I came here uh, through an IHS internship called the Coke Summer Fellow Program, uh, KSFP, and I think in my entire uh, class of 84 KSFP students, I was the only one who would self-describe as primarily focused in foreign policy and the national security state. 
And this was surprising to me. I expected to meet more libertarians like me. And the truth is that the DC libertarian movement, um, if you want to find someone who, who focuses on tax policy, you, they're kind of a dime a dozen. There were plenty of libertarians in my KSFP class who wanted to focus on um, health care and economics and the drug war and philosophy and law and so forth. And all, all of those are really important subjects, but I was, uh, I was perplexed at the lack of foreign policy expertise in the movement. And that, that perplexion grew um, when I realized that the established libertarians, the professional libertarians, the guys that we were trying to all be like in KSFP, also had a dearth of foreign policy expertise. Um, even, even the few who focus on foreign policy I, it's oftentimes do not have as radical a position uh, as you would hope for. Some of them even support, supported the Iraq War, which I think we still have not come to grips with as a movement. Um, if you take the most basic definition under prevailing international law to which the United States is a high contracting party. I'll try to speak up, sorry. Uh, the Iraq War was clearly uh, one of the most clear-cut uh, examples of a war crime in modern memory. Um, vehemently opposed to every libertarian principle you can imagine. Part of this bias, I think, rests in libertarianism's focus um, on economics. Um, that tends to push people into the domestic sphere. I think also libertarianism's past as a, an outgrowth or at least an alliance partner of the conservative right. Um, many people just harbor nationalist feelings like they're taught in school to wave the flag and thank people for their service in the army and, you know, um, many people just thought of the greatest generation who defeated the Nazis or many people more just during the Cold War uh, thought communism was a greater ideological threat than the sometimes big government policies of Republicans or the fact that they were so often pro-war. Um, but still, I, I, when I came here, I thought this shouldn't be the case. More libertarians should be very clear on, on the war issue. From my perspective, libertarian principles are firmly grounded in an understanding of the state as an inherently violent institution, as we just learned from Bob Higgs. Um, surely we as libertarians can recognize that while the barrel of a gun is theoretically behind every tax on income and cap on carbon emissions, when the government literally takes out a gun on a mass scale and gets hundreds of thousands of people killed, surely that should be something that we should be able to recognize as a movement as distinct from, say, an increase in taxes. It's a special kind of state exercise of power. I think in the back of everyone's minds, we understand this. We like to hark back to the principles of the American Revolution. Um, Thomas Jefferson said that war was pernicious to liberty. James Madison said that if, foreign, if, if oppression and tyranny come to this land, it will be in the guise of fighting a foreign enemy. Um, Murray Rothbard said that the state thrives on war, it expands on it, it uh, glories in it. He once lamented that conservative libertarians are particularly interested in price controls and taxes, but, quote, somehow when it comes to foreign policy, there's a blackout. Charles Tilley, who you may not know, he was an anarchist and a scholar um, that was famous for his work on the development of the modern state. And he wrote a book in the 1990s called Coercion, Capital, and European States, which studied the development of states in Europe from the year 990 to 1992. And what he found was that war making is central to the development of the state. Uh, if you go back to tribal hunter gatherer societies and uh, then, you know, fiefdoms and into protection rackets and kingdoms and monarchs and into nation states, what you find is that the, um, ab the ability to collect and administer coercive means to either subdue domestic rebels or to challenge neighboring rivals is literally what, me what it means to be a state. You can, take a you can eliminate the entire welfare state and you still have a state. You can eliminate 
all financial regulation, you still have a government. But if you, if you fiddle with this particular aspect, you no longer have something that you can describe as a government. I'm going to quote Tilly uh, at length here, if you'll bear with me. He writes, states themselves operate chiefly as containers and deployers of coercive means, especially armed force. Nowadays, the development of welfare states, of regulatory states, of states that spend a great deal of their effort intervening in economic affairs, has mitigated and obscured the centrality of coercion. Over the millennium of European history that he studies, military expenditures and, and uh, usually has consumed the majority of the state budget um, and have typically constituted the larger, larger, largest sim single branch of government. Over this period, and this is the important part for the libertarian movement if we want to know where we should really place our priorities, um, he wrote, major mobilizations for war throughout this period provided the chief occasions on which states expanded and consolidated and created new forms of political organization. Many of you will, m might recognize this language as being reminiscent of the very famous phrase now by Randolph Bourne that war is the health of the state. And it, it shouldn't be a surprise, government gains in war. Greater interventions into the economy are permitted. Abridgments of indi individual liberty are more readily tolerated. Everything that eventually we as libertarians come to oppose uh, starts with the war issue and the, the possibility that the government can expand with justifications originating in the national security. To bring it out of the abstract a little bit, if anything, World War II and its aftermath should have made clear beyond a shadow of a doubt where the most destructive tendencies of government lie, and therefore really where a great focus of libertarianism ought to lie. Britain, which was on the verge of self-destruction in Europe like the rest of the powers, uh, was uh, declining and rolling back its empire, and the United States was really taking over the mantle. Um, to manage world affairs and expand its imperial reach the globe over. Um, Washington in these early Cold War years really embarked on a policy of global domination. We divided up the world into different war zones. Every corner of the planet was placed under the auspices of some subdivision of the U.S. military and national security state um, to be utilized in the effort to maintain what the Pentagon calls global hegemony or unparalleled power over all other states in the system. We created NATO to maintain military dominance over Europe and prevent the rise of another Germany or even Britain. Uh, we placed military bases in every corner of the world, particularly in important strategic choke points. We overthrew governments in Iran, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, the Congo, the Dominican Republic, South Vietnam, Chile, Brazil. We increasingly went to war without the consent of Congress, which speaks to the tendency of the national security state to whittle away at the rule of law, which is another principle of libertarianism. The logic of hegemony, of obtaining ever more power over the globe, led us into geopolitical strategies that got us into wars like Korea which is largely forgotten now, but killed millions of people and really contained unspeakable atrocities. Uh, and then, of course, Vietnam, which got three million people killed. We virtually destroyed an entire country. They're still dying from chemical warfare. Um, we went to war with Iraq in 1991, not so much as George H.W. Bush said to liberate Kuwait, but to maintain a balance of power in the world's most uh, energy-rich region that was amenable to the power interests back in Washington. Um, and then, of course, we sanctioned Iraq during the 1990s, killed maybe a million people, and invaded on false pretenses in 2003, uh, and killed another half million people, probably. But even without these gruesome details, the logic of obtaining unparalleled power or hegemony should set off alarm bells for libertarians. I mean, anyone who can regurgitate cliches about checks and balances in the Constitution or 
Lord Acton's famous uh, quote that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Anyone that, that sees this can recognize that the threat of government in its national security capacity um, is a, a greater threat to liberty than probably anything. This grand strategy in foreign policy, by the way, it's worth noting, was greater in scope and directly affected the lives of vastly more individuals than uh, Social Security or Medicaid or Medicare or all of them put together. The scene that we have now in February of 2014 is that we have a president who can draw up kill lists and uh, assassinate suspects, including U.S. citizens, despite their Fifth Amendment rights to due process, on presidential decree, largely in secret, and using secret law. We have continued collusion with autocrats in the Middle East, uh, who we continue to arm and prop up. We have a war in Afghanistan that has still not ended. Amazingly, we have a war on whistleblowers and on journalists, unprecedented usages of the Espionage Act to crowd out dissent and criticism. We have the NSA, which is virtually trying to destroy every sense of privacy that we've ever known. We have what seems like a traditional security uh, competition in the Asia Pacific with China for regional hegemony in that region. Uh, which, by the way, could lead to utter catastrophe given that China is a nuclear weapons state and that these uh, weaker states in the region like Japan and the Philippines um, are creating extended tension between China and the United States. So we're at the Students for Liberty conference and I assume that many people here are looking for careers in this, in this world. And I mean, I guess the, 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 essentially this is a long way of asking people to, uh, if, they, if they are not already focusing exclusively on foreign policy and national security, to consider devoting considerable time to it. And if you're already my kind of libertarian, uh, you should press your peers to um, come to grips with uh, war in the national security state as the most important issue that we ought to focus on. We can all agree that we oppose a 3% rise in the marginal income tax rate. We all oppose, obviously, government-run health care exchanges. But we really need to be more united and more firm in our opposition to what Charles Tilley called uh, the most ancient and innate function of government, which is war making. Uh, that was my talk set for, I believe, 15 minutes. <laughs> Scott Horton uh, was supposed to come here. We were going to split the time evenly um, and then leave an equal amount of time for, for questions. Um, but I, I suppose I'll just go with the questions and then run out of here uh, early. I think you might want to go to the mic if you have a question so that the oh, camera can no, pick up. I can project. So <laughs> So my first well, it's not for them. I believe oh, it's for okay. the camera. Okay. <laughs> Hello. It's not even on. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Sorry. So my first question is: is um, I like the fact that you 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 you're making the connection between foreign policy and what's happening here domestically. You know, why is it so hard for libertarians to 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 comprehend that a big government that's capable of fighting three different wars at once is the same big government that can do that, that that's able to do that here. Um, you know, war, war on drugs or war on whistleblowers. Um, what's, what is the barrier? What, what's, what's happening in the libertarian mind that's incapable of connecting those two concepts? I'm not sure I have a, a better answer than what I said in the talk. I mean, on the one hand, I think that libertarianism's connection to economics has, uh, makes it especially easy for people to end up focusing on domestic issues. I also think that libertarianism's connection to conservatism and maybe the Republican Party a little bit tends to give a pass on 
foreign policy and war and, and that kind of stuff. And also, it's just, you know, I can't blame people per, for having pet issues. Uh, if, they, if they're really passionate about health care, then by all means, they should focus on that. We need specialization as such. But um, there needs to, I think, and you know, it, it might be changing now. I think it is changing. I think that this conference several years ago, like when I first came here, uh, was thanks to FFF, it's changed m mostly. But I think that even, you know, even back then, it, there was much less focus on, on foreign policy and the war issue. And I think it's changing all the time. So I think there's more and more people. Ron Paul probably had a lot to do 2008 and 2012 with the refocusing on, on, on war and civil liberties. So, I mean, we'll see. I don't have a really good answer, but that's the best I can do. I am a sports fan. I go to Wizards games. I go to Nationals games. And it seems as if you can't go to a sporting event these days without, ha during at least one time out, you know where I'm going with those, during at least one time out, they salute the military and they have veterans there and all that sort of thing. And it usually sponsored by a defense contractor or sometimes sponsored by a defense contractor. I'd like your perspective on these timeout uh, hosannas uh, tossed to the military. Yeah, I mean, it gets really, really explicit, especially if at football games when you have flyovers, flyovers of military jets, you know, booming through the air like we're all supposed to cheer, like. Uh, we have war paint and all this stuff. As a sports fan, you know, might not like my full answer because sports are really kind of a playful, um, uh, not inconsequential exercise of the kind of spirit that infuses uh, warfare on, on the domestic scene. People, when, when, when the government gets into the, and they identify an enemy, I mean, any football game really, if you change the colors and maybe people's outfits, you could mistake it for a Hitler rally quite easily. People are simply getting so juiced up over their tribal al allegiances, which of course, if you happen to have been born in Boston like me, I'm supposed to be a Red Sox fan, which is as stupid as I'm supposed to have allegiance to the government that I happen to have been born under. Um, but you know, th this is how people, this is the, the emotions. It's sports, so it's okay. You can play and it's like no, nobody's dying except football players with concussions and suppose, you know. But, you know, uh, those kinds of things are very connected, I think, the war fever and the fever that you have at a sporting event. Then when you scream and you rally and you wear the same face paint and the same colors and everyone chants the same chants and stuff like this, it's the same kind of thing. So I think that's probably why they're so connected. I I'm ready for a rebuttal if, if you're happy for it. Hi, John. Uh, you touched on the Iraq sanctions a little earlier. Of course, there's the very famous Madeleine Albright quote, you know, we're okay with half a million Iraqi kids being dead. Um, my question about the Iraq sanctions from 90 to 2003, there have been numerous studies done on those sanctions by the UN, by university professors, by medical journals, documenting the excess deaths and so forth. We have not seen any studies that I'm aware of on the Iran sanctions about the brutality of those sanctions, what their effect on the fatality of Iranians. And there have been documented cases on Iranian patients suffering from hemophilia that have died because they were not able to receive medicine as a result of these sanctions. So why don't we see more studies on it? I see articles here and there, but no concrete studies. And is it because the fatalities are just not as brutal? Or do you think the push for war against Iran has anything to do with it? Is Ahmadinejad, was he just too big of a boogeyman? Um, do the Iran peace talks have anything to do with it? So, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts on why. Thanks. I think there's a few things going on here. Uh, what distinguished the Iran sanctions and the Iraq sanctions were not necessarily the severity. They're, they're very severe in Iran. The difference was that the sanctions in the 90s against Iraq started right after the first Gulf War, when the United States military bombed a lot of the civilian infrastructure in Iraq. And so they bombed sewage facilities and so forth. So, uh, you know, uh, polluted waters started flowing into the Tigris River and people started consuming this stuff and getting typhoid at levels not seen anywhere but, you know, famines and so forth. So, uh, you know, 
Iraq was already at a much worse place when their harsh sanctions uh, were, were, were employed. And, um, you know, that made the child mortality rate skyrocket. People couldn't get the right kind of medicines in. And that is the case in Iran. What's happening in Iran, though, the civilian infrastructure hasn't been completely destroyed and bombed, at least since the 80s war with Iraq. Um, and you have, a, you, they're starting at a different sort of starting point. Iraq was much lower. There have been documented cases where cancer patients or hemophilia patients cannot get their medicines imported. Um, and this is obviously a terrible crime and it shouldn't be accepted at all. But it's not just getting medicines in, it's also, um, you know, the, uh, the inflation is rising uh, uncontrollably. Unemployment uh, is rising. People can't get food on the table anymore. Um, and so, you know, I have a lot that I can talk about with regard to the uh, negotiations going on right now, but I don't think we have full time for that. I hope that uh, they are successful even on the terms of uh, jerks in Washington, mm -hmm. and that will mean that at least a considerable portion of the harsh sanctions that have been imposed since Obama will be lifted, but we'll see. Hey, John. Respectively, um, I know this is a conservative organization, and we are in a relatively conservative um, uh, conference. Um, but in the mainstream, especially, I mean, the U.S. press sucks. We know that. But uh, in terms of covering these wars and covering these countries that the United States has diversely um, became involved in, um, generally speaking, there are a lot of countries that are from Islamic backgrounds, and I'm a practicing Muslim, and I want, I, I, I'm always interested in. At what level of understanding do they understand the religion versus the practice of it? Um, and and, I, and I, want to, I want to guide a question more. Do we really understand these people that we're invading? And um, what do you think? What do you think the U.S. press, or how much the U.S. press influences the public the public opinion, especially organizations that are fairly conservative? Because I mean, from my understanding, from my knowledge. The conserv some some conservative organizations, and not to generalize, have not understood um, Islam or Muslims at all. Thank you. Yeah, so and again, there's a number of things going on here. First of all, not only do they not understand these societies and the religions that are there and the people that are there and the cultures that are there, uh, but they're, they hold them in contempt with a severe prejudice. And they draw up these mad ideas about, um, you know, 72 virgins and these overly simplistic, you know, if you, if you pray five times a day, you are therefore a suicide bomber or a future one. I mean, these are incredibly racist notions. And they're driven in part by a war fever and in part by um, a government and press which reinforces them. Uh, to a large extent, not, that's not entirely, that's not an absolute, but um, yeah, we don't have any understanding uh, uh, of these societies and, and um, you see what that, what that leads to. I mean, to, to take your point about the power of the press to influence public opinion, I think it was in 2011 or 2010 that there was a poll done which asked Americans uh, it, it found that I think something like 60% still believed that the United States had found weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I mean, this doesn't have specifically to do with Islam and people's perception of it, but, you know, people have, we talk a lot in public choice and in libertarianism about rational ignorance. Um, people are busy. They have lives and homes and jobs and so forth, and they can't do research projects on their own. But the, the mere extent of their delusions that they hold about not only other societies but about U.S. foreign policy is staggering. The Bush administration knew, knowingly lied about its justifications for going into Iraq, I believe. Um, especially the vice president's office was pressuring intelligence analysts to come up with certain things with regard to uh, weapons of mass destruction. And anyways, even if Saddam Hussein had masses of uh, nuclear weapon stockpiles, he still would not have presented a threat because he might have been a lot of things, but he was, he would, he's not suicidal. And he would never have invited nuclear retaliation by using one on the United States or Israel. 
Um, and so, you know, the delusions in, in the mass notions of foreign policy are, are, are very big, and that's one of our, I think, greatest challenges. So you mentioned Ron Paul, and um, Ron Paul brought me into a non-interventionist foreign policy, and I think the way that he did it can be summarized as, you know, when you watch Chinese troops in Texas, the, the, the theory of blowback um, is instead of where the peace activists have throughout history tried to get Americans to identify with and empathize with um, victims of American war making, um, blowback gives us the opportunity to empathize with terrorists, with the people who are doing the killing, who aren't us. Um, I'm curious about, you know, this seems to me like uh, one of the rare instances of uh, a, a person on the libertarian spectrum getting the attention of and the sympathies of uh, even non-libertarians on a non-interventionist foreign policy. Do you agree with that? Do you, do you agree with that assessment of the strategy? And is it something that you engage in or you would uh, recommend other people do? Yeah, I mean, I try to. Ron Paul did it very successfully. <clears throat> um, but, you know, the appeal would not be targeted necessarily at terrorists and their feelings and that kind of thing. I mean, they're criminals and they're committing crimes and they're killing innocent people. And if we try to, the experiment of understanding as opposed to denouncing and getting all riled, then yes, it'll be incredibly enlightening. But the more powerful thing about that kind of enlightenment is what it tells us about ordinary peaceful people who are not reacting violently to our ruthless aggression. Uh, sanctions is a perfect example. Most people, when, when, no, most Americans have no idea what went on in Iraq in the 1990s. Two UN officials, two high-level UN envoys that were assigned to Iraq in the 1990s resigned in protest because of how terrible the sanctions were. One of them described it as genocidal because he could not handle the fact that child mortality had risen so drastically that 500,000 children below the age of five were killed. Nobody can really talk about killing that many children and have it still be the sort of superficial talking heads uh, campaign that you see on MSNBC and Fox. It becomes much too serious. And so, yes, talking about our victims uh, needs to happen more than anything else. If we simply get people to understand that because you live in a different part of the world and because geography happens to vary, uh, it doesn't have an effect on whether or not human life is valuable, I think that's an important tool to enlighten and to persuade, absolutely. At an earlier panel today, there was some discussion about whether the president can even do anything about the, the war state we're in because he's faced with the sort of institutionalized behemoth of the military and the National Security Agency and the Homeland Defense and their um, leadership comes in and briefs him and you know tells him about all the horrible things that are going to happen if he doesn't let them have their way. and. Um, it, you know, he doesn't want that to happen on his watch. And if the president doesn't go their way, they can, they're institutionalized and they can wait it out and wait till the next president and keep fighting that fight over and over again. Um, so that the real problem or the real reason that we're where we are is sort of that national security complex, military industrial complex that's just gotten so out of control. And then there was also some discussion of the fact that one of the only recent pushbacks was on Syria, where we actually didn't haven't yet at least bombed Syria and I was wondering what what happened that made that pushback actually work on Syria what what factors coalesce so that we actually were able to at least at least postpone it if we haven't stopped it and how can we have future efforts like that to, to push back on that a little bit and try to reduce the hold of the army on on our foreign policy well I think there are, there's a hopeful way to answer that and there's a not so hopeful way to answer it. Uh, I think that people, I think that it is true that the general feelings in society and in, among the population uh, and their s certain kind of activism that stopped the Syrian war from occurring. 
I think what you had was an Obama administration that was already reluctant to do it, even though it caught itself in its own sort of box and was going to. Um, and, but what you, what you have now is extreme um, reluctance to get involved abroad after Iraq and Afghanistan. And people are tired of it. And people mainly, uh, with regard, you know, it ties into my last answer, which is that I don't think it's necessarily everyone was saying, please don't endanger Syrians. I think they were saying, we're out of jobs right now. We are um, not, we don't want to pay for another quagmire. We don't want to send, send our men and women to uh, fight and die in another quagmire that doesn't directly affect us. I think that was probably the most um, important uh, sort of move and push that pushed the population to call all their senators. And I know I spoke to uh, Justin Amash about this at, after he spoke at the Cato Institute. It really is about get senators and congressmen getting calls on the phone. If they get 100, and you probably know 100 people, uh, it'll strongly influence what they're about to do. Um, so, I mean, part of this is just the ebb and flow of being sick of tons of war and therefore people are more active against it. It happened after the Vietnam War as well. I think, to your question about how to sustain it and how to keep it going, like I said before, we have to keep reminding people, first of all, of the, our victims or potential future victims and uh, to not stop talking. It, it's never time to stop talking about the warfare state. You know, it's never time to stop reminding people that it's incredibly big and incredibly interventionist and that we shouldn't tolerate it for another minute. And so I guess it's just to keep up this feeling of, of this slightly anti-war, anti-interventionist feeling, which is at a certain point right now, but we should fight to sustain it and we should continue to write and talk and badger our family and so forth to, to how you doing? Um, so I notice at events like this, uh, I find people coming from all different traditions and different jobs and different ways of being concerned about certain issues, and they all have different specialties. But to me, they all seem to be, not all of them, but most of them seem to be looking at the symptoms. And to me, they all have a very common cause and a very common piece of philosophy. Um, where they all go wrong, you know. Um, and it's a really good idea once you know those handful of pieces of philosophy um, to be able to relate your specialty to that. Uh, people need to have the skills, you know, in every different area of application. Um, but how much do you go back to first principles and those simplest pieces of philosophy and what are yours? How would you state them? Thanks. I mean, this is something I kind of struggle with because um, I, I, my mind is naturally kind of tilted towards the empirical. I like to talk about, I like to throw a bunch of facts at you and just badger you with them until you submit. Um, and that can work on some people and on some people you need to go back to first principles. I don't typically do it. I leave that for masters like Robert Higgs. I don't know if you saw his talk right before mine. but. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, it would just be a personal uh, preference, and, and when, it, when it comes to what people are receptive to, I think it varies as well. I, I, would, I just try to focus on what I do best, um, and that's, that's badgering people with, uh, I'm being cut off, I'm sorry. Can we do one more? Or is, or is no, because we have no speaker. I'm sorry for that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. Great, Great job, Joe. Scott Horton is, uh, he has one of the greatest talk shows you've ever listened to. I mean, his stockpile of, of interviews is the most incredible thing in terms of foreign policy experts, civil liberties experts. All archives there online. He formerly was a uh, uh, associate with nwar.com, and then he went out on his own. And so he's got the Scott Horton show. And he's an absolutely incredible asset to the movement. We're, we're all just 
terribly proud of him, and we wanted him to come and participate in this conference and share his perspective. So, Scott Horton. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry that Scott Horton could not be here today, but I'm an uh, icicle in the shape of Scott Horton, and uh, so I'm not quite as good on foreign policy as him, but I'm pretty close, so. Okay, now, um, also, I cannot read on the airplane, and so I'm not really prepared. This is going to be more of a winging it than a, a really prepared kind of thing, uh, so sorry for the amateur nature of the proceedings here. Um, okay, so... And also, I'm not sure what John already told you. So, <laughs> hi, John. So, yeah, sorry if I'm a little too redundant here. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, well, let's see. Um, I guess I want to start off by saying that, yes, in fact, in case we're not clear, in case there's any confusion for anyone here in the audience or on YouTube later on, America is, in fact, an empire the evil kind, just like all the other empires. <laughs> and it's true that it's, they call it neo-imperialism, it's more an empire of bases than outright colonialism, uh, like back in the old days. But, uh, I mean, really, you could argue that from the American perspective, it, that just makes it that much worse, because that means that everything goes out and nothing comes back in, as Garrett Garrett put it. And so, when you look at who are the special interests who are involved in lobbying our government and promoting empire, you don't find the American people anywhere. What you find are rent-seeking factions, like, for example, executive vice presidents at Lockheed or the American Israel Public Affairs Committee or whatever it is. And so they have their specific interests to gain at the expense of the rest of us. Not that it would make it okay if they were just looting Baghdad for all the gold to bring back here to the heart of the empire, but still it just shows you how much more wasteful it is when that's not even really the goal. Uh, the Cato Institute did a study back in 95, 96, uh, back when we were spending chump change compared to now, and they said we spend, I think it was more than twice the amount of money securing Middle Eastern oil than we actually spend on Middle Eastern oil at the pump. It's absolutely ridiculous. And uh, if you looked at it from the point of view of the nation as a business, it makes no business sense at all, only for the certain vested interests. And then so then the real point is the same thing's going to happen. Our empire has happened to every other one before it. It's going to fall apart. It already is falling apart. Empires murder suicide. And we all learned this as little kids. I don't even know when I first learned that all empires fall. It was probably before Return of the Jedi even came out. <laughs> that all empires fall. And, um, and so, you know, if, if you're living in the heart of the empire and you would prefer to maintain your standard of living that you have here, uh, you can stop thanking the empire for it. It's in fact costing you. And, uh, and start to push for the rollback to try to preserve what's good of what we already had. Okay, and now, so, uh, I'm sure that Oliver Stone and Bumper Hornberger and the rest of them have done great work on the Cold War and, and the big phony Cold War and who knows what else at this conference. So, I basically just want to talk about post-Cold War uh, imperialism here real quick. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart, James Baker and George Bush Sr. immediately baited Saddam Hussein into invading Kuwait, told him, we're not involved in your border dispute with Kuwait. We don't get involved in inter-Arab affairs. Go ahead. They gave him the green light. And then they used his invasion of Kuwait as the excuse to expand America's footprint into the Middle East. Now, I couldn't find the footnote. It must have been in Chalmers Johnson's book, because I can't find it online anywhere. But I know for a fact I read that Lloyd Benson, former senator from Texas, you might remember uh, Mondale's running mate from 84, uh, Texas oil man, conservative Democrat, old school Texas Democrat. He warned George Bush Sr., do not put troops on Arabian soil. You are going to drive the crazies crazy. Well, that's exactly what they did. In fact, um, the Mujahideen who had been the Reaganites' friends in fighting the Afghan war against the Soviets, um, one of their main groups, the Abdul Azam group that became Al-Qaeda, uh, bin Laden's first real grievance uh, after coming home to Saudi Arabia from the Afghan war 
was that the king of Saudi Arabia invited the Americans to occupy the Saudi desert and wage the war against Saddam when bin Laden wanted to use his own men to go and, and fight another jihad. And um, so that was the beginning of his estrangement from the Saudi king and the beginning of his recruitment efforts uh, against the United States of America. Um, and then so, but back here at home, you had all the think tankers and not just the neoconservatives, although of course they're the very worst of them. But uh, you look at Hillary Clinton, she's the cookie cutter, center left, internationalist, so-called realist, uh, you know, humanitarian interventionist, if she feels like she has to use that as an excuse uh, for her time. But she's basically the walking center of American foreign policy consensus. She's for everything. She's for all the drug wars all across Latin America. She's for and has been, just like her husband when he was the president, for expanding NATO all the way to Russia's borders so that we have Germany surrounded and, and working further on uh, surrounding the Russians as the Cold War never really ended, the Soviet Union fell apart, but our Cold War against them never really stopped. Uh, look at the attempted regime change in Kyrgyzstan just a couple of years ago, for example, and the attempted regime change going on in Ukraine right now. Um, but the neoconservatives came up, typically the Hillary Clinton types would tend to prefer to go through the United Nations and get the French on board to defer costs and this kind of thing if possible. Whereas the neoconservatives said that we don't need the UN Security Council, we have the National Security Council. And since our military is more powerful than any other military on earth could conceivably be anytime soon, we're just going to do. And we're not going to ask. As Karl Rove told Ron Susskind, we're an empire now. We create our own reality. And the rest of you in the reality-based community, you're just left to take notes on the new realities that we create, as you will. Um, and so with that hubris in mind, uh, they moved through the entire 1990s, through the entire Clinton years, to expand NATO all the way to Russia's borders, and uh, he created the Caspian Oil uh, Security Initiative and whatever to start buying up all of the, uh, the dictators of the stands in Central Asia uh, for the Caspian oil resources, uh, which we don't even need. Um, and anyway, they created this thing in 1991 after the first Gulf War called the Defense Planning Guidance. And what it said was we'll never let any nation or any group of nations anywhere on the planet Earth combine together to even begin to look at us funny like they think that they could even ever match our military might. We will bomb them off the face of the earth long before they ever even get there. That's it. Permanent, benevolent global hegemony, as Robert Kagan and William Crystal call it. Uh, we will rule the world and no one will ever, uh, ever, which is a really long time, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge that power and, and we just won't let them. So that's what's led to the terror war, is the, uh, not, obviously not the NATO expansion in Europe so much, as the expansion of the empire across the Middle East. And if you ask uh, uh, Ramzi Youssef, who did the first World Trade Center bombing, or any of the Al-Qaeda guys that did any of the attacks after that, there was a National Guard barracks in Saudi Arabia attacked in 1995, then the Kobar Towers attack, which Bill Clinton blamed on Iran because that's what Israel wanted. Uh, in 1996, which was actually Osama bin Laden did it. Um, and then there's the Africa Embassy attacks of 1998 in Dar es Salaam, uh, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya. And then uh, an attempted destroyer attack, and then the successful attack on the coal, et cetera. And all of these guys, uh, uh, all of the you know, honest policemen and intelligence agencies around these cases and all of the, the paperwork and the rumors and the interviews and the anything coming out of any of these attackers said that what they're doing is they're targeting the United States because the United States of America is already at war with them. And that is by way of support for the Israeli government and their permanent occupations of Lebanon and Palestine, which they finally pulled out of Lebanon in 2000, but we're talking about back then. Um, and, uh, of course, the bombing of Iraq and the blockading of Iraq from the bases in Saudi Arabia, which killed a million civilians in the 1990s. And even though bin Laden himself was a murderer and no one should take his word for anything, what's important for our purposes is that we understand what it was that he told people to recruit them. How did he get them to join his cause? When the Ayatollah Khomeini denounced mini skirts and primary elections, nobody cared in the 1980s. But bin Laden cited specific foreign policies of the United States of America that had to be avenged and he was able to recruit guys to do that avenging. 
It's also the fact that Mohammed Atta, the ringleader of the 9-11 attack, the head hijacker here in the United States, filled out his own last will and testament um, in 1996 during Operation Grapes of Wrath, Israel and southern Lebanon. It was just a couple of days later that the first Khan of Massacre took place. Bin Laden cited the Khan of Massacre in his, his first declaration of war against the United States. Mohammed Atta, just like Americans who went and joined the army after September 11th, he filled out his last, war, his last will and testament and said, that's it, I'm joining up the war, but on their side. And then so when he and Ramzi bin al-Sheib and their friends took the trip that so many other Arabs take to Afghanistan to go through the camps, Bin Laden got word that these guys have German passports. They could be very useful to us. And that's how the Hamburg cell of wannabe jihadis became Bin Laden's ringleader pilots of the September 11th attack. And uh, again, it was Israel that pushed, American support for Israel, that pushed Mohammed Atta uh, into making that choice. And in fact, uh, Terry McDermott, LA Times reporter, in his great book, Perfect Soldiers, says that Ramzi bin al-Sheib and Mohammed Atta and all of their friends would sit around at their Hamburg apartment and do nothing but talk about Israel and how Americans must die for what Israel did today. Day after day after day. Uh, during Israel's uh, occupation of southern Lebanon and, of course, the continuing occupation of Palestine. Okay, so then 9-11 became the excuse for all this new intervention. You all saw those planes on TV, came out of the clear blue sky. And according to the president, that's all you needed to know. According to all of the media and the entire national security state, that's all you needed to know. The, 20, the 20th century is long gone. And never even happened, in fact. Uh, 20, 2001 was the first year ever, uh, September 11th, the first day ever. And so, brand new excuse. Evil doers have come and done evil for no reason, and so now we must, uh, you know, avenge ourselves. And of course, with the lie being, uh, the lie about their motive being that the only reason they attack us is because of how good we are, then that means that we have no option except to ruthlessly fight back. What are we going to do? Stop being good because they hate us? Of course not. We can't do that. I mean, don't tell Bush and Obama. <laughs> but um, uh, So they made it seem like, hey, we're all just innocent victims. Anything we do after this will be defense. But here's the joke. And here, I'll get the quote right for you when I tell you the joke. Bin Laden's son gave an interview to Rolling Stone magazine in the summer of 2010. Uh, he said, I was still in Afghanistan. Oh, first he compared America to the bull that chases the red scarf. Then he said, when I was in Afghanistan, I was in Afghanistan when Bush was elected. My father, Osama bin Laden, was so happy. This is the kind of president he needs. One who will attack and spend money and break the country. I'm sure my father wanted McCain more than Obama. McCain has the same mentality as Bush. Now, of course, this is a naive take on Obama, but we understand his point, uh, what he's getting to. Um, but then the Rolling Stone reporter asks bin Laden's son, Omar, if he thinks that there will be any more attacks in the United States. And he replies, I don't think so. He, his father, Osama bin Laden, this is 2010 when he was still alive, he doesn't need to. As soon as America went to Afghanistan, his plan worked. He's already won. And so now it makes sense that what, if you weren't already aware, that what bin Laden was attempting to do was replicate their victory with the CIA's help back in the 1980s against the Soviet Union against the United States. Uh, you know, everybody here wants to give Ronald Reagan credit. Well, yes, these guys, they give credit to Allah and, you know, their faith in him and a good old trusty AK-47. And so, uh, his entire idea was not to scare Americans away with the September 11th attacks, that we better not mess with these hombres, but to drag us in, to bait us like Bush Sr. did to Saddam into Kuwait, to trick us into chasing them into their neighborhood where they can bog us down in their quicksand, where they can snipe down on our guys from the top of the mountains down, and where they can bankrupt the empire so that eventually the American politicians will have to bring it home. They'll have no choice but to bring it home. And then 
all these little separate local jihads across the Middle East can get back to work overthrowing the kings and the sultans and the military dictators that we've been backing over them all these years. And so this is why Michael Scheuer, the former chief of the bin Laden unit, says that when America invaded Iraq, that was the hoped for but the unexpected gift to bin Laden. Are you kidding me? Now you're going to get rid of Saddam for me too? And hoot and holler. And they just thought that was hilarious. In fact, you might remember right before the invasion, bin Laden put out a message saying, uh, urging the Iraqi people to all rise up against the socialist infidel Saddam Hussein and the Americans too when they come next week, he said. Um, and so uh, then what was the effect of occupying Iraq? I'm sorry, I know I'm running low on time here. Um, the effect of occupying Iraq was, first of all, first and foremost for the purposes of al-Qaeda terrorism, it turned the entire Anbar province and all of the Sunni, provinces, Sunni Arab provinces of Iraq into completely lawless free fire zones where they've been waging war ever since there. Ten years straight now they've been at war there. Tens of thousands of young men have come from across the Middle East to train, get battlefield experience, and go back home again, just like in the 1980s in Afghanistan, the blowback which we're dealing with now. Um, and then, of course, the other big part of the Iraq War, and this is something they never explain on TV because I guess they figure you just don't care, but what they did was they fought that whole bloody war in order to drive the Sunni Arabs out and to give the capital city of Baghdad to the Shiites for the first time ever, and the first time the Shia Arabs have ruled an uh, uh, Arab capital city in a thousand years. And so I'm not saying that in and of itself is wrong, but just that it means severe consequences. It means a defeat that the Sunni Arab king, sultan, dictators, Mujahideen, and anyone else are not going to sit still for and stand for to the degree that they can help it from here on. I mean, this is, this is certainly uh, a, a, a major provocation, a major setup for major blowback continuing to come on down the line. And as we can see from the invasion of Iraq, our, our sock puppet dictator in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, was absolutely right. He warned George Bush, don't do this, you're going to create 10,000 bin Ladens. And that's exactly what he did. He spread them across the Middle East. They went home to Libya, they went home to Syria. Now, funny enough, uh, Obama's policy, even more than Bush, is so centered around Israel first that, oh, oh, I almost called him Osama, Barack Obama has America backing Al-Qaeda, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group and Ansar al-Sharia in Libya and backing the Islamic State of Iraq, the al-Nusra Front and the new so-called Islamic Front in Syria. And so, um, you know, if you just picture a map of Asia, on September, say, 30th, 2001, al-Qaeda was a couple of hundred guys exiled on the Duran line between Afghanistan and Pakistan the CIA with their laser pointers and the Air Force with their daisy cutters turned all of them to dust but two or three dozen, which for some reason Rumsfeld surrounded them on three sides at Tora Bora and let them escape to Pakistan. But anyway, there were, there were just a few dozen of them literally that escaped to Pakistan in 2001. There are now thousands of Al-Qaeda guys spread because of American foreign policy, uh, because of the American government doing everything wrong uh, now spread from Afghanistan all the way into Mali in uh, Western Africa. And uh, the consequences uh, will continue to flow and they will, be, they will continue to be cited as excuses to carry on the exact same disastrous policies on into the future. Uh, and now to wrap up here real quick, I'm sorry that I've kind of been disjointed and gone on so long, but let me just uh, say real quick here at the end that what, uh, what people really need to understand about this at the end of the day is that we can't afford it. We spent already at least eight trillion dollars on the foreign empire and the homeland security state since September 11th. Those are Chris Hellman's numbers. It's actually uh, Robert Higgs there in the back as well as uh, Mother Jones and the National Priorities Project all agree we spend one trillion dollars a year plus now on national security. A trillion dollars a year. And here's the real rub. Uh, errors mine credit to, to Bob. They always inflate a giant bubble in order to pay for their wars. Except for Korea, they did that one on a balanced budget somehow. <laughs> but, but all the rest of the war since World War I, they've inflated a giant bubble because if they tell you they got to raise your taxes by 30% 
to have a bonus war, you're going to balk and not let them do it. So what they do is George Bush, you might remember, sent you two different years in a row, right? He sent you a $300 rebate check in the mail. Like, here's your dividend from all the, all the money we're making off of the Iraq war or something. You're supposed to internalize this as being for your profit somehow. But in fact, what was happening was uh, George Bush entered into a conspiracy with Alan Greenspan to lower interest rates through the floor to put the lead foot on the gas pedal and inflate a massive bubble, which, thank God, popped in 08 and not in 09. George Bush almost made it out of office with that thing crashing on somebody else's watch. Um, but that's the cost of the Iraq war is your time spent in the unemployment line. Uh, you don't remember them raising your taxes, but you're sitting there staring at your, she at your feet, shuffling, wondering if you can get some part-time work. That's your cost of killing a million Iraqis. So I hope you had a really good time. Uh, it's a hell of a price to pay. And uh, as I'm sure John really covered this uh, you know, in much more detail than I will uh, be able to, uh, we've lost so much liberty here. And one of the things that bin Laden was trying to do in his own words, was to create for us in America a choking life, meaning so many cops that we just can't stand it anymore. So much police state, so much national security agency that we finally just say, you know what, we don't even want an empire. And so I'm not saying that we should give in to terrorists and do what they say, but it just happens to be the right thing to stop doing the wrong thing anyway. And so it seems like a pretty good compromise that we can make. And, and, you know, it was Gene Kirkpatrick, the neoconservative, who said back at when the Soviet Union fell apart, they're all good. Now we can be a normal country in a normal time. I think it's about time. Thank you.